I'm John Duvall. Welcome to the Scriptural Way Bible Study. The Scriptural Way Bible Study is brought to you by the Seminole Point Church of Christ, located at 16300 North May Avenue, Oklahoma City. On behalf of the elders and members of the Seminole Point Church of Christ, I would like to thank you for your interest in spiritual matters. Now, let's take our Bibles and seek the Scriptural Way. Good evening. I'm John Duvall. I'm John Hall. And this is the Scriptural Way Bible Study. John, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Good. I'm doing fine. Doing fine. Dale was supposed to be here tonight, but last night his mother-in-law fell and broke her hip. And they uh, fly flighted her here to Oklahoma City and they put her in the uh, Mercy Hospital. So she was having surgery this afternoon slash evening, and so Dale is with her, her and, uh, of course, Miss Florence tonight. So we need to um, let Dale know that we're definitely thinking of her and keeping her and them in our prayers. So it's good to have you with us. We've had two weeks off. It was way to gospel meeting last week. So glad that you could join us. We're trying a few things a little bit differently. Don't be too surprised. We do that from time to time. And you'll notice that the video um, and the commercial spots look more like a letterbox, and that was not intentional. I thought they would look a little bit differently than that, so we'll, we're going to tweak that. But you should be seeing us in what is a 16 by 9 format. And so we're doing things a little bit differently, and we'll see how things go tonight. You know, I learned I was working on a project at the house last night, and I hit a snag and hit another snag and something said, just stop, John. <laughs> Tried it one more time and nearly put my foot through the roof, through the ceiling of our formal dining room. I, my foot slipped off, I misstepped and, and went down and I heard a crack. When we lived down in Jonesboro, I'll tell you this true story here real quick. It was Christmas time, we had our tree set up and some of our presents and stuff was up in the attic above the tree and my foot slipped, put a hole right above the Christmas tree. We told the kids that's where Santa Claus dropped down from. Um, Do we have the audio only going? Uh, no, no. Do you know how to set that up? Okay. Tell them. We'll, we'll bring that up here in just a second. Okay. Thank you. Um, so anyway, thankfully, it's not a full hole. And um, I didn't tell my loving wife about it. I thought I'd save that to her for a surprise. And really thought about saying, did you feel the earthquake? <laughs> I mean, just, but, you know, we don't lie. and. She would have seen through it about as good as my mom used to be able to see through lines. So anyway, so we changed a few things here. Hopefully I have better, better results tonight than I did there at the house. So I hope that your week is going well, and we want to thank you so much for taking your time, taking uh, time out of your busy schedule to join us. I think we have the audio stream back up and going, or up and going now. So uh, you can let us know in the chat room whether or not that is the case. All right. Before we start with the lesson tonight, we need to let you know that we have a gospel meeting that starts Friday. It's a short, simple, three-day meeting. It starts Friday night, and we meet at 7 o'clock for a 30-minute period of song service, which we will stream live. And the way that we stream things now, they can see the words and the music on the, stream, on the screen at the same time. So if you want to sing along, you can. Um, but our regular services with the preaching will be at 7.30, and that's Friday night and Saturday night. Then Sunday morning we'll meet at 9.30 for the first lesson, 10.30 for the second lesson in the worship service. And then Sunday night, instead of our regular time of 5 o'clock, we'll meet at 7 o'clock for another period of song service followed by the lesson at 7.30. So if you live in the Edmond, Oklahoma City area or you're going to be passing through, we would love to have you to come out and be our guest. Who's doing the speaking, you ask? Well, his name is Kurt Jones from Conroe, Texas. Kurt Jones from Conroe, Texas. And if you're not able to join us locally um, here in person, then please feel free to make use of the stream. And Lord willing, you can be benefited by the hearing of the Word of God as well. Okay. Well, it looks like we think we have everything going and everybody is um, raring to go for the study. Tonight, John, we're going to be looking at the question. And I recognize that we could handle this in five minutes. 
What does the Bible say about the sinner's prayer? Nothing. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next week, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> because really, when you study with people about it, you, you have to take more time. I mean, it is true. And we'll talk about a little bit later, even some uh, religious leaders in the various religious groups who push the sinner's prayer will admit that it was not to be found in the Bible. And we'll talk more about that, of course, as we get to that point. If you haven't downloaded a copy of the lesson, please do so. You'll see it beneath the video window. It is in PDF format. You can download it and print it out and have it for your own purpose as well. The sinner's prayer. When we say the sinner's prayer, what we mean by that and what the denominational world means is that it's quite simply a prayer by which one confesses the name of Christ, asking Jesus to enter into his heart. Now, John, in the outline, we have um, a copy of a version of the sinner's prayer. This comes from www.allaboutgod.com uh, slash become hyphen a hyphen Christian dot htm and you'll see that up on the screen in a minute but go ahead and read if you would this example and i know you're not praying and everything but <laughs> read for us the example here of this prayer okay uh the example goes like this father i know that i have broken your laws and my sins have separated me from you i am truly sorry and now i want to turn away from my past sinful life toward you please forgive me and help me avoid sinning again I believe that your son, Jesus Christ, died for my sins, was resurrected from the dead, is alive, and hears my prayer. I invite Jesus to become the Lord of my life, to rule and reign in my heart from this day forward. Please send your Holy Spirit to help me obey you and to do your will for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay. Now, one thing we, we do need to point out, and this is in the outline, that many evangelical denominational churches who use this prayer as a means of evangelism will be careful to note that it is a modern day 20th century um, practice and you're going to find as, as we go through the study that there are some of them who just about renounce the sinner's prayer okay but what we're going to do this evening is you know there is the what is but you'll notice in the outline that we've got some observations that we're going to make about the sinner's prayer. And some of these observations is going to come from a speech that was given by a Calvinistic Southern Baptist by the name of David Platt. Now, I noticed that I failed to put the website where I found this quote. You can search his name. And there is about a four-minute video clip on YouTube of a longer sermon he preached, and the excerpt comes from that video clip. But because of the nature of it, many people have, have you know, they just shortened it down and said, hey, here's what, you know, one of the leaders in the Southern Baptist Church, or at least preachers, is saying about the sinner's prayer. It's quite interesting. So, but the first observation is that the sinner's prayer is not found in the Bible. Notice the following quote from David Platt. This was on March 1st in 2012. He said, I'm convinced that many people in our churches are simply missing the life of Christ, and a lot of it has to do with what we've sold them as the gospel, i.e., pray this prayer, accept Jesus into your heart, invite Christ into your life. Platt continued saying, Should it not concern us that there is no such superstitious prayer in the New Testament? Should it not concern us that the Bible never uses the phrase, accept Jesus into your heart, or invite Christ into your life? It's not the gospel we see being preached. It's modern evangelism built on sinking sand. And it runs the risk of disillusioning millions of souls. Now, it kind of makes sense that David Platt would be opposed to this because he is Calvinistic. And the Calvinistic belief, especially the ones who are diehard Calvinisms, um, you cannot pray, you cannot go to God in prayer and ask, ask Jesus to come into your heart. Okay. With Calvinism, God has got to choose you, and you've got to be moved by the Holy Spirit to then come to God. You know, so it's, it's not really, it really can't be an effective evangelistic tool if his belief was right. But it's interesting, though, that he acknowledges that, as a matter of fact, there's, a, there's four observations we'll show on the screen here, which I have this view on the side of so, uh, the the, the side by side, that'd be fine too. He says, there's no such prayer taught in the New Testament. 
observation, uh, the Bible never uses the phrase, accept Jesus into your heart. The Bible never uses the phrase, invite Christ into your life. And he says this is a modern evangelical method of attempting to bring people to Jesus Christ. Modern meaning within the last, you know, 60, 70, 80 years. Now somebody on one website thought that they had found where Charles Spurgeon had said it. You know, used talking about the sinner's prayer. And um, when you look at the context of what Charles Spurgeon, he was telling all quote-unquote Christians that they need to humble themselves as the uh, publican did who said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And so he wasn't, it wasn't an altar call. He was telling all Christians, you know, to submit unto God. But anyway, that kind of gives you, the simple fact of the matter is, it's not to be found anywhere in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts or comments? Well, Paul in chat room said one of the most popular TV preachers, and we've mentioned this name before, Joel Osteen, mm -hmm. advocates a version of the sinner's prayer. Then he says, if you just prayed that prayer, we believe you just got saved. Yeah. And uh, I was looking at a website this afternoon, and it was an interesting comment that they made on theirs right after their version, which is exactly like this, the sinner's okay. prayer. Um, at the bottom it says, if you decided to repent of your sins and receive Christ today, welcome to God's family. Now, as a way to grow closer to Him, the Bible tells us to follow up on, uh, on our commitment. And then it lists some things like get baptized, tell others about your faith. So they're saying, if you if you repent of your sins and you're, and you're saved today, mm -hmm. Now go and do these other things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Same kind of concept there. Well, and what some of them, or many of them will say if you talk to them, they, they will say that it's more than saying a prayer. Mm -hmm. You know, many of them will say you truly have to believe. You right. truly have to be willing to repent. And right. All, all the ones that I saw, the prayer was, was, was just the words, but it was always their, their thought process was even that, that the words didn't necessarily matter how you right. said them. It was what was in your heart. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so they'll, they try, you know, he used, he used the term um, um, that there is no such superstitious prayer in the New Testament. And it's very possible that even some in the, the denominational world almost teach it as a very powerful prayer. But many of them recognize, like you said, it's, it's not simply the words. Mm -hmm. you know, if, you know, and, and you gotta give them a little bit credit for that. You know, at least they're, they're acknowledging that, the, that it's possible you could think that way, and if you did, it was wrong. You know. Right. Um, let's see, any other thoughts? No. Okay. So second observation? Let's go on to second observation. Okay. What is that? Second observation of the sinner's prayer limits one being saved to a series of expressions. Uh, number one, you have an expression or recognition of one's sins. Okay. I don't All know right. if we can argue too much with that. Uh, that we might want to do that, right? Sure. <laughs> number two, an expression of belief in Jesus Christ. Well, okay, I don't hear anything too wrong yet, okay. right? Okay. All right. And number three, an expression of a willingness to repent of one's sins. Okay, all okay, well, that sounds pretty good still. Sure. And number four, an invitation to Jesus to come into their heart. Okay. Right. So, one, two, and three, in and of themselves, if you just take them aside, sound pretty good. Sure. Uh, when you apply them all together, however, and say that, you know, this is all that's needed in right. order to be saved, and this prayer is what you should say from your heart, it's all mm -hmm. about your heart, uh, and then you even throw in number four there, then, then we have a little bit of a, a, a problem there with that. Well, let's... Well, we need to go ahead and take our first break. But when we come back from the break, let's go ahead and break this down a little bit. You know, what are some thoughts about each of the points there? And do we agree with them? Like you said, you know, we don't have much issue with some of these. Mm -hmm. Let's kind of elaborate and see, you know, what is the biblical support for each of these positions? And then, like you said, even going up to the fourth one and, and see, kind of make the comparison there. So, um, and I, you know, I've never really told you much about some of these ads other than the fact that they're really old by now. We've got to do some new ones. But the first one that we're going to be playing, I think it's the first one, uh, is one of our elders, Ron Whit, And he, he um, in this little recording, gives you basic information about the church. So I'll let you watch that, and we'll be back in just a moment and continue this. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ron Whit, one of the elders of the Seminole Point Church of Christ. On behalf of the elders and members of the Seminole Point Church of Christ, I would like to invite you to be our guest at any of our worship services and Bible classes. The meeting place of the Seminole Point Church of Christ is located at 16300 North May Avenue, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, zip code 73013. The Seminole Point Church of Christ meets Sunday mornings at 930 for Bible classes. 
10.30 for worship service, and 5 p.m. for our afternoon worship service. We also have Bible classes on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Whether you live in Oklahoma City area or you are traveling through Oklahoma City, we would love to have you come and be our guest. We have Bible classes for all ages. At the Seminole Point Church of Christ, our focus is to teach only the Word of God. Rest assured that when you visit with us, you will find that we will appeal only to God's precious Word. Now, let us return to our study. Welcome back to our study. You know, John, you were talking about the, the first aspect of the sinner's prayer, um, a, an expression of recognition of one's sin. Mm -hmm. And it's true that a person, in order to become a Christian, they've got to believe in sin. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe in your own sin, then you won't even see the need to, for salvation from that sin. And we see this on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 37, where some 3,000 people acknowledged the presence of their sin. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and read that for a moment. Okay. Acts chapter 2, verse 36 starts, says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Okay. Now, very simple, very clear observation. Peter in the previous verses had just accused them of sin. Okay, verse 36, this man whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and, Lord and Savior. Their question is an understandable question. They realize that they just sinned against the Messiah, the one whom Jehovah God had sent to this earth. They rejected him and killed him. Mm -hmm. So naturally their question is, what shall we do? Okay, so there is a clear expression of recognition of their sins, turning to and saying, what is the solution for that sin? Okay, any thoughts before we continue? I'm trying to figure out what I wrote this, so eventually I'll remember. So. Okay, you want to read it now and we can help you out there? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> but Paul does say in the chat room, it is interesting that most of the televangelists that recommend a sinner's prayer then say to get in a good Bible teaching church. Well, that is... If they teach the yeah. Bible, they would reject the sinner's prayer. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, does, they, and it's interesting, they don't say which specific one. Mm -hmm. Of course, they believe, many of the denominations believe that the church is made up of individual churches, denominations, as long as you believe in Christ, it doesn't matter. You know? Yeah, and um, you know, talking about that exactly, is that the, the problem is that they don't understand what good Bible teaching means. Because even yeah. these individuals will look at these verses and will say, well, we'll see that, that verse says you have to do this, and this verse says you have right. to do that. In a lot of cases, those individual one or two verses, if that's all you looked at, then you could come to some conclusion of do this. Right. And, and only this, nothing else is required. Uh, but as we know, um, you have to look at the whole New Testament, the whole Bible, and decide what's, what's truly required it's as a whole. Some of the word. And, and yeah. some of this kind of reminds me, I read this on one of the internet sites that talked about the, uh, the sinner's prayer today, and it was just kind of struck me of the mindset of these individuals. Uh, and here it says, uh, talking about four verses that they were going to go and use uh, to prove this point. And each one is just one verse. Mm -hmm. And so they're proving these points with just this verse. And in and of itself, the verse could almost be said to teach that if you didn't look at the context and look at who's being talked to. And we're going right. to do some of that tonight. Sure. But it says, this, this one said, here are the first four verses all showing you exactly what is occurring behind the scenes when God starts to move in on someone in an effort to try to get them saved. So God's like, it's almost like God is sneaking up on you. That's part of Calvinism. Right, trying okay. to get you saved. Right. Uh, that, that's their mindset. Yeah. It, it's just interesting. That's a very good point. At that point, it has, <clears throat> pardon me, it, it implies there's nothing that you do on studying. Right. It's how does God move you to. Right. Yeah. And that's what they're saying. They're saying without God coming to you, you know, there's no way. Yeah. You know, he's got to come and move on you. He's got to send his Holy Spirit to touch you. Fundamental Calvinism. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point there. Well, okay, so the second thing, they acknowledged um, the expression of their willingness to repent. Mm -hmm. Well, this falls right in line with the Scriptures, although it's more than an expression. Uh, Peter's answer to these people on the day of Pentecost, he said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God 
will call. Mm -hmm. So Peter did now what's interesting is Peter told them to repent and be baptized. He didn't tell them, okay, you need to express your willingness to repent. He told them to repent. Mm -hmm. You know, to turn away, to turn from and to turn to. And doing that, they would accept the command be baptized by the authority of Jesus Christ, and the result would be the remission of their sins. And they'll take this verse at the end of that and apply it to what I was just talking about. Right. You know, as many as our God shall will call. That's it. Point. End of statement. Yeah. End of study. Nothing else to worry about. Never looking at the con the question of well, how does God call His people? Exactly. That, that's yeah. not even a question that comes to mind. It's just that verse said that right there. We take it. We don't consider anything else. Yeah. So it must be that God has to call you personally, and aside from anybody else. That's and right. And so just like He must call you then they look at all those passages where he hardened somebody's heart, and it must mean the same thing. He specifically, purposely chose them and said, no, I'm going to make you not believe. Well, with, with pure Calvinism, mm -hmm. that is exactly the way he works. Right. Now, I, some of them will say, and some I've known in the past, will say, you can learn it through Bible study, but the Lord can also call you. Mm -hmm. So they kind of, you know, kind of middle of the road. Right. This one, one lady I knew one time, she, um, she <clears throat> was Baptist in her belief, but she disagreed with a strong Calvinist that we had talked to a little bit. And she, she didn't believe that a baby who died would go to hell. You know? And she believed that a person could study the Bible and come to an understanding of the truth there. But they also believed, though, in the corrupted nature of man. They just view how God forgives it differently than the, the Calvinist. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, look at Acts yeah. chapter 2, verse 41 and verse 47 there. Okay. And he continues here, it says, Then those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And in verse 47, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Okay, so those who gladly received his word, they repented of their sins, they turned. Acts 3.19, he says, be converted. I think we'll talk about that here in a minute. Mm -hmm. They turned, and they were baptized, and then they received the remission of their sins. All right. Very simple. Yep. And I think that's where we look at this one again and we say we have, there is some truth to that statement right. and then there is unfortunately the application that they take with that statement is false. Right. And simply saying a prayer is not enough change. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's got to be some change. For a person to say that prayer and say I'm saved and well I don't need to be baptized right now, they've not made the repentant change. Right. They've and not made that change. Paul taught many of the churches, you know, he, he said many times, this is what you were like, right? and now this is what you are. Exactly, complete yeah. change. And, and, and he's given the example of what it meant to repent. What did it mean to turn from something and turn right. to something? Okay. That's and right. so, like you said, it's, they didn't just express the desire to repent and the willingness to repent and then not do anything about it. That's right. Right, there was action that had to be involved there to a, be considered repentance. A clear change. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, the next thing they say, though, is there needs to be an expression or confession of one's belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Again, <clears throat> like you said earlier, we don't disagree with this. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting to note, though, is that in Acts 2, there is no record of the people saying, we believe that Christ is the Son of God. So one might look at it and say, technically, they did not confess if confession was limited to a verbal statement. Mm -hmm. okay. And I threw in another caveat to that just when I read that. I All thought right. to myself, well, there's many times where we don't have every, every single sentence and word and thought that was expressed in a given context recorded. Right. And so there's nothing really to say that there wasn't a point in there somewhere where that happened. That's right. Well, and, and then that's, that's a good point. We're not told everything. Right. That's true. Um, where I thought you were going is like, for instance, <laughs> Acts 2 38, he mentions repentance and baptism. Right. Mark 16, 16, belief and baptism. And um, Romans 6, 3 and 4, baptism. And then Romans 10, 9 and 10, belief and confession. Mm -hmm. And someone will say, well, how come we don't have them all in one place? And it has to do with the context. Mm -hmm. You know, what was the writer addressing? Right. Now, in this case in point, I would suggest, first off, they never said, hey, we believe that Christ is the Son of God, come into our heart. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they didn't say right. that, okay? Someone says, well, how do you know they believed? Look at their question in relation to what they just heard. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the Philippian jailer's a bit different because when he saw the power of God being displayed in the great earthquake and they had not escaped, he said, well, you know, for clearly he recognized that they represented a God who was greater than any he had known. So he said, what do I need to do? And their answer was simple, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
but he had no knowledge. They then went and taught him, mm -hmm. and then he obeyed. So, you know, different answered based on the context right. here. Um, but someone says, okay, then we assume they believe, and I think it's a fair, I think it's a safe assumption. Where do we see confession? Well, in their obedience, mm -hmm. in their willingness to obey. I've told this story before, I think, uh, from the pulpit, and it more illustrates sometimes that we look at the plan of salvation as, as five steps. I've done this, now on to step two. You know, mm -hmm. It's kind of like, kind of like maybe the 12-step program or something. Um, and this young lady came to me one time, her and her husband, and she was a relatively new convert, maybe a couple of years, and she was very, very troubled because her and her, her, and her husband, might have been fiancé at the time, were studying with a preacher and his wife, and they had studied a considerable amount, exchange and everything. So finally she said, hey, you know, I'm ready to be baptized. So they drove down to the building and they went to the baptistry and the preacher and her went down into the baptistry and he baptized her. He came up and his wife said, you forgot to ask her if she believes. <laughs> and so she was worried. It, 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 she started thinking about it, worried. I said, well, did you believe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did they know that you believed? Yes. Then you confessed. I mean, what's? Right. I mean, you 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 acted upon that belief. And it could be argued that these people never made that public confession. Right. And a lot of times in the in the passages that we look at, where there is the term confession mm -hmm. or confess, right? Uh, it's usually used from what I remember in the present tense. Right. Uh, if that's right way to say it. present perfect, maybe I think is possibly the way. Sounds to say like it. a perfect way of saying it. Yeah. That. There you go. But um, meaning that you know it's something that they were doing, mm -hmm. and it's something that was continued to be done. It's right. not something you do one time, you confess Jesus and then That's right. and from that point on you never have to confess him again, but you you're you're always confessing him. And it's through the way you live, the That's fact right. and, and what you do, how you obey him. A little bit later we'll talk about Romans ten, nine and ten, but oftentimes we use that as part of the plan of salvation. But in reality, while it would apply to that, he was telling Christians mm -hmm. to continue to believe with their heart and confession is made unto salvation all Christians. I made that point one time in a sermon a number of years ago that it applied always to all of us. The sermon's over, the walk to the back, the fellow turned to me and says, you gonna correct what you said? I go, what? He says, you said that applied to us as Christians. I says, well it does. I mean, what, what's, what is he had heard it so long is simply a plan of salvation verse, he couldn't see that even as Christians we had to continue to, he would not deny that we had to do it, but he didn't right. see that verse as teaching that. So it was you know, I think sometimes we limit ourselves as to the way we view what is actually in the text there. Right. But in any case, any thoughts? Yeah, you know, we had a few thoughts there in the chat room. Uh, Jeff Brown here says, I know brethren in the Virginia, North Carolina area who have offered $1,000 to anyone who can find the sinner's prayer in the Bible. It says, nearly 20 years, no one has been able to claim the money. They do this to show people that it's just not in the Bible. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Rosalito good looks point. at... Uh, I'll point out Acts chapter 9, verse 11, And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. Okay. Um, That's a good point. And he looks at verse 18, following up that, and immediately there fell, talking about Paul. Right. Immediately there fell from, uh, from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. So, you know, so Paul, we, Paul spent three days in prayer. Mm-hmm. Why wasn't he saved? Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And did he confess? No. I mean, at least it's not in the right. recorded record there. Right. Yeah. So, but he did through his again, like you say, through through what he That's did. Right. He was confessing his belief. I heard a story years ago, and, and we've talked about this before, of course, that this this little girl was asked in Bible class, "What is repentance?" And she said, "Well, that's what you do down the aisle." <laughs> so the teacher goes, "Huh?" She said, "Yeah, you believe in your seat." You repent in the aisle, you confess down front, and you're baptized in the back. Okay, as they get older, we need to teach them it's more, <laughs> more than that. You know, it's foundation blocks we try to steal within them that needs greater teaching, obviously, as they get older. Okay, so we agree that you have to admit your sin and believe you had sin. We agree that you have to believe in Christ and that you have to repent of your sins and be willing to confess Him, to be unashamed of Jesus Christ. But the last thing regarding the sinner's prayer is that, is that it, it is that personal invitation to Jesus Christ to come into their heart. There's nowhere in the Bible where we say, Jesus, come into my heart. We do find that we're baptized into Christ and subsequently put on Christ, 
and we know that we are added to the body of Christ. But nowhere do we see anyone ever saying in the New Testament, Jesus, come into my heart. That's not the way fellowship with Christ is accomplished. It is through our obedience and the grace of God. Um, and Peter, I mean, of all times, if the sinner's prayer was going to be an acceptable way and an inspired way, then Peter very well could have said it. Mm -hmm. But he said nothing that would be similar to that. Any thoughts? I have another one there, but it's just tumbling around so much in my brain, it's not going to come out right now. So <laughs> well, I'll tell you postpone. what. Let's go ahead and take a break. <laughs> and um, on the other side of the break, we'll come back and see if John had any enlightenment <laughs> on the thought. I understand exactly what you're saying. And what we'll do is when we come back from the break, we're going to look at observation number three. And that is the sinner's prayer puts faith in a gospel teaching that is incomplete. And so we'll talk about that on the other side of the break. Stay tuned. We will be right back. Greetings. I'm Dale Decker. This is Dan Cross and Ron Buxton. As elders of this church, it is our responsibility to watch over the congregation, to warn the members of spiritual dangers, and to instruct the church in God's Word. While we as elders share in the teaching process, we also have a preacher, a very good preacher, and many excellent Bible class teachers who help aid in the teaching of the congregation. On behalf of the church, please accept our invitation to be our guest at any of our Bible classes and worship services. While you will receive a warm and well, uh, friendly welcome, I promise you, you'll not find a friendlier congregation than this congregation. And, but we will not pressure you. Uh, we trust, though, that if you find that what we teach and practice to be according to the Bible, then you will choose to come back and give us an opportunity to study with you and to get to know you better. You know, John, Gene made a very good point. Um, Gene is the one just outside of camera range to that way right there. And um, he made a very good point that we, we were talking about confession is much more, you know, we, we confess by the way that we live and things that we do. That's even, that's even more true or needs to be emphasized as Christians. We can go around and verbally confess Jesus Christ all that we want. But if we're not living it, then it's all for nothing. You know, we have to let that light be shining so that God may receive the glory. And uh, we, we may tell a hundred people in a day, you know, praise Jesus, praise God, let me tell you about the death of Christ. But yet if we are cursing and living ungodly or in an unscriptural marriage, you know, embracing something that is ungodly, practices in the homes, anything like that, then we're not confessing his name. You know, it, it, it is an empty confession there. Right. And we see an example of that in the, in the Gospels when Jesus was teaching as well. That's true. Where he looks at those people who said, Don't, didn't I not profess, did I not proclaim you know, your name? Did I not go and do great yep. works and many great deeds and wonders? And all this in your name, basically. Right. You know, in, in essence, trying to say, we're con you know, we, we lived for you. We did this for you. Well, that, that's right. Matthew 7, 21 following. That's yeah. exactly right. But apparently the rest of their life, there must have been something amiss because he didn't say, yes, you're right, good job, come on in. You know, he said, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's right. So they were practicing iniquity. They were not obeying the law of God, even though they were saying these great things. That's exactly right. Yeah. And that does tell us that it's possible to be a believer and to teach a version of the gospel, but it be an incomplete version. And that's kind of the next observation we're going to look at here. Any comments before we go on though with that? Yeah, Paul says uh, another phrase that is sometimes used is accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Uh, another phrase that is not found in Scripture. Mm -hmm. He said, I heard some uh, of our folks use this phrase to mean obey the gospel, but many mean something far different. You know, and I think that phrase along with the phrase about, uh, you know, having Jesus become our personal Savior, uh, it kind of, to me, harkens back and kind of reminds me of that better felt than told religious experience that so many people desire. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to feel, oh, well, well, Jesus is inside me. You know, he, yeah. he's living in me. And they want to feel real warm and, and mushy, I guess, about that. You know, they want, they're very emotional about it. Right. Which, there's nothing wrong right. with someone sincerely. Right, exactly. Being, right, right. Um, but it seems like they, they really don't want to take responsibility right. for, the, for any actions that they have. It's Jesus has to come and do this for yeah. me. And so it, it takes all the responsibility off of them. To obey him, it puts it all on God. Well, God didn't, you know, if God didn't do it, then it, I'm not chosen. Right. Or, or something along those lines. That's a good point but. there. I heard a preacher a number of years ago, uh, when we were living in McAllister, came and held a meeting. 
And he used the phrase personal savior. And he said, you know what, there's nothing wrong with that phrase because Jesus died for each one of us individually. Um, or I should say it's applicable to each one individually, his death. The problem though is that sometimes if, what happens many times is someone in the denominational world will get a new idea. And it's kind of like throwing a branch into the river. If you go downstream, you will eventually see that branch. And there have been many new things come up in the denominational world, denominational churches, that if you'll watch, it will eventually enter into churches of Christ. Some of it bad, all right? Some things, nothing wrong with just a new phrase and terminology. But with this one right here, the phraseology, you know, accept Jesus as your personal savior, that is associated with the sinner's prayer. <clears throat> and we just, we just had to make certain that when we teach the truth, that if we have visitors there who are from another religion, if I was simply to end the sermon, you know, please accept Jesus as your personal Savior, come forward as we stand and we sing. Someone who's been raised in, the, in some Baptist religion or denominational religion may come forward and say, I just asked Jesus to come into my heart. I'm ready to, you know, I'm saved now. You know, and so we need to make sure that with invitations there's clarity. But I've heard that there are some Church of Christ preachers who are no longer extending the invitation. They'll pr come, come to the end of the sermon and say, if you got any needs, let us know. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm. You know, have a nice day. I don't know if they're that cavalier, but <laughs> the point is there are many of them, it's almost like a speech. And someone says, well, what if there's nobody there who needs to be saved? Well, you still say it. I think it's a good practice. <clears throat> yeah, I think um, <clears throat> in some cases, I, I agree with you. I don't know necessarily if it's wrong for someone personally to think within themselves that Jesus is, is, is a personal Savior There's for me. Nothing, he is my Savior. Right, nothing wrong with that. But right. when you're teaching, right. when you're, when you're uh, evangelizing, mm -hmm. uh, we, we need to be, I think it's wise, let me say this, to mm -hmm. use Bible words and Bible ways as we've heard before. Exactly. Um, if you start taking words that are used out in the denominational world that aren't truly found in phrases that aren't found in the Bible and you start applying principles to those phrases, mm -hmm. Um, I think, again, you're right, you can really get confusion uh, exactly. going there pretty yeah. easily. You know, theoretically, go up to the door of somebody and say, I want to talk to you about Jesus being your personal Savior. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've done asked him into my heart years ago, and I'm good to go. Right. I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> it may not work that way, obviously. And, and, and you don't want to be against change just to be against change. I mean, if, if there's nothing wrong with it, and if, if scripturally based, then give consideration. But if you're doing it because everybody else is doing it and you think that's going to appeal to the masses, wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, but I think that's a whole nother study in and of itself. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, the third observation we find here is that the sinner's prayer puts faith in a gospel teaching that is fundamentally incomplete. Now the reason why we say that, we mentioned a while ago that it is true that we believe that it is true you have to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Mm -hmm. In the outline there, we've got three passages. Uh, one is John 3, 16 that you know very well. One is Mark 16, 16 that we've referenced quite often where he connects belief and baptism. And to the point there even that if you don't believe you'll be condemned. Take that, exactly what it says there. If you believe and be baptized, you'll be saved. If you don't believe, you'll be condemned. And then John 8, 24, Jesus makes the point that they'll die in their sins if they don't believe. Mm -hmm. So we have no disagreement with that at all, do we, regarding belief? As a necessity, right. As a necessity. Now, we will clarify it may be a different belief. Mm, right. And we'll kind of discuss that as we go through right. here. Yeah. Um, any thoughts? Yeah, I agree. It definitely could be a different belief. It's more than just that, the, the idea of, uh, of some mental ascent that says, okay, well, I know that there is a, a God up there, and, and um, Jesus, you know, I, I believe he's, he's the Son of God. Right. And, and, and then just stopping there. You know, there, there's more to belief. If, if you truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that then creates in you a desire to go, to go farther, which we'll, right. we'll see some more here in a minute. Yeah. One thing, and, and I feel like sometimes I harp on this probably more than what I should, but when you look at uh, the, one of the Greek words translated as belief or a variation of belief there, um, especially in this particular context of Mark 16, 16 and John 8, 24, it means essentially a persuasion or conviction. 
you know, a persuasion or conviction that persuades you to change, mm -hmm. that convicts you to change. It's more than an academic acknowledgement. If you have someone who says, well, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but I don't see the need to change my life, that person is not convicted enough to truly believe. Right. You know? And so the, that's the belief we're talking about. It's where you've studied the Scriptures and you are convicted by the evidence of the Scriptures to act. Mm -hmm. so that's the belief there. Yeah. Uh, Paul had a comment in here, and I'm I'm just trying to figure out where that applied to. I'm thinking it applied we to your about discussion the invitation. about invitation, yeah, right? Yeah. He says, you don't know if they may need to respond to the invitation, I guess, there. Mm -hmm. Prior to the lesson, they may, not ha they may have no plans to respond, but Bible preaching asks for a response. That's a very good point there. Yeah. And so you, you don't know. Maybe there's something about the person you don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's someone who looks back after the lesson and realizes that their first time they were baptized, that it was for the wrong reason and that they're in need of, of right. being saved. So, yeah. Alan just threw out uh, Ephesians 4, verse 5, one faith. And we know that verse there talking about the one faith, the one baptism. Yeah. So there's only one. That's right. And, and, That's exactly and so right. there's not, you know, you, you can't have this idea that b this belief is, this, this means this for this group of people, but belief over here means this for this group of people, and it's, you know, it's okay to be different. That's right. It's okay for everybody to have a different belief. That's exactly right. right. It's not. It's, there's only one. Yeah, one, one faith. And if you don't have that faith, you don't have the faith. Right. Um, Jude 1, 3, who uh, once for all delivered faith. Faith was once for all delivered to the saints there. Singular faith there. Um, you'll notice on the screen there, we're, doing, we're able to do something a little bit different. Travis is now able to bring up instantly verses called to from the chat room and possibly bring up the chat. I haven't seen you do that yet, but what happened? Okay, yeah. So, <laughs> but we're still ironing out a few little um, hiccups on it. So. Okay, so mm -hmm. we recognize that you, that you have to believe. Right, and we recognize here it's true that a person needs to recognize his guilt of sin. Exactly. And make the decision to repent, to turn away from sin. Yeah, Jesus taught that quite clearly. Yeah. I think obviously it, it makes, it's common sense that if you're going to repent, then you would have to have believed that there's something to repent of. That's right. That's so you change. have to believe in your, that, that you have sinned, that you are guilty of sin. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, That's look right. at Luke 13, verse 3. It says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Right. So without repentance, what, what's left? That's right. And that's what, that's what we showed Peter said mm -hmm. in Acts 2, verse Acts 38, a while ago. Right. Um, and Acts 2, 3, 19, we'll bring that one up on the screen here. Peter says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Repent and be converted. Right. Someone says, Well, there's nothing about baptism. Well, there's nothing about belief and confession. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's the conversion process that we're right. talking about there. So we agree with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to believe, you have to be willing to repent of your sins. You've heard us teach this a lot. Um, and we, we've already discussed confession a good bit, but let's go ahead and read, if you would, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Again, the context here, an argument could be made that this is something that we continue to do and we never stop. But, this is, but here he's saying why the apostles went out to preach, so that people may hear and they might believe. And so let's read that here. Verse 9, Romans 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your hearts that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Very clearly. Mm -hmm. And like I said, there's more to this than the simple one step when you're down front. Right. You know, so, so much more than that. Mm -hmm. So, we agree. You believe, you got to repent, you got you got to confess. Jesus Christ. We already right. covered that well ago pretty well. The fourth thing, and this is where we get to the incomplete. It's, it's like you're walking on a bridge. Mm -hmm. Well, last night, why did I fall <laughs> nearly through my ceiling? Um, I had put some decking up there in my attic, and one decking stopped at this raptor. It's about two feet wide, and the other one went out to the next raptor. So in walking, and I had little tubs here, when walking, when I got to the end, I had to step over to this one, and then I go on raptor and raptor. What happens is I was, I was not looking down. I would looked up for a moment, and I took a step off the short one. Mm. It was incomplete. <laughs> on the other side of the break, though, let's go ahead and take our last break for the evening. We're going to talk about that. What, why would we say that the gospel that the sinner's prayer is founded upon is incomplete? Mm -hmm. So and we'll, and we'll I'd like to back that. up two steps and talk just a little bit about why it's incomplete for two and three as well. Excellent idea. Because it's a little bit incomplete there. Okay. All right. <laughs> and you know, 
a little bit incomplete is incomplete. Right. There's a commercial <laughs> out there, and this guy asked someone a question. He says, I'm like 95% sure. The yeah. guy says, so you don't know. Yeah. Well, no, I'm 99% sure. So you, you don't know. Right. <laughs> so it's kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we'll continue this more on the other side of the break. Stay tuned. We will be right back. If you would like more information regarding the Seminole Point Church of Christ, then visit our website at www.seminolepoint.org. Better yet, come see us. Our meeting place is located at 16300 North May Avenue, Edmond, Oklahoma. We meet Sunday mornings at 9.30 for Bible classes, 10.30 for worship services, and then Sunday afternoons at 5 o'clock for worship services. We also have Bible classes on Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock. Thank you so much for your interest in the Seminole Point Church of Christ. We're looking forward to seeing you soon. Welcome back. John, let's talk now about some of the incompleteness you saw in the earlier points right. there. Well, like back at number two, we're talking about a person needs to recognize his guilt of sin and make the decision to repent and turn away. And I think the sinner's prayer is incomplete there. Okay. And that someone may have said some words that they are, oh, you know, I want you to help me repent. I want you to help me, I think it says stop sinning. Sure. Right? Don't help me to not sin anymore. Um, but that's not repentance. That's not them actually changing their life and point. turning away from sin. Right. Uh, that's them looking to God and hoping that He's going to, you know, help them with it. And, and mm. God will help us with it when we turn to Him and look to Him. But there's an action that's required. But who does He to blame repent. if He doesn't, if He doesn't make the change? Right. You know? Yeah. Is it God's fault or, you know, it's not his fault, right? Because he yeah. already asked God to help him. Exactly. And some people look at it that way. Right. Well, ask God and God didn't help me, so they're more cynical. But, right. You know. And the, the other one. Yeah, and it says in verse, we've had that point in three, uh, it's also true a person needs to be willing to profess their belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, being unashamed of him. And looking at the sinner's prayer, um, I think it still falls a little short there in the true um, concept of confessing Jesus Christ. Right. I, I believe, as we talked about, there's more than just simply saying a word or two um, about the fact, well, I do believe in Jesus. Right. I, yeah. think, I think confession uh, involves a little bit more than that, a lot more than that, with our actions. Well, Paul makes a good point in the chat room, I mm -hmm. think, would be, we can go ahead and bring, bring this in now. <clears throat> because he says, the problem seems to be when salvation is limited to, to one thing, whether it be grace, mercy, faith, repentance, confession, baptism. Any of these alone cannot save. Mm -hmm. And that's a very good point. Now, he does say that we are often accused of teaching salvation by works. Works, even works of faith, alone cannot save. Right. And that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. I wonder, sometimes we, we lean on baptism so much because the world, the denomination world, focuses on that as being not necessary mm -hmm. so, for salvation. Right. And so we lean on it, and almost to the point of where one might say that it sounds like. We're emphasizing a work over the right. others, and right. we, we, we don't need to do that if that's the case. Right. And again, it's just a misconception, and unfortunately, it's one that people aren't willing to take time to listen to, that's the right. answer for, the response to. Uh, but it is, that, it is that misconception that we're trying to say that all you, all you have to do when, you bat, when you're baptized, somehow that is, is earning your salvation. And that's what they try to say that we're saying. Yeah, right. They're, they're telling us that, well, you're teaching that, you know, it's a work that you do that earns your salvation. Right. And we know, and we don't teach that, that's right. uh, that it's much different than that. It's a work that we're, we're following in obedience to Christ's exactly. Word uh, because He has told us to do that. Why did Noah build the ark? Right. Because God told him to. Yep. And he could, have believed, he could have believed all day in the mercy and grace of God, but if he hadn't have built the ark, that's right. still wouldn't have been saved. And he wasn't saved until he built it, and he was in it, and the water level rose. Right. 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. Right. And, and he didn't just build the ark. I mean, think about how detailed he, he, of a description he had to follow. Every single point, the type of wood, the dimensions, right. you know, what animals to bring on. I mean, what, what if he had just made it out of pine instead of gopher wood? Yeah. Well, he probably uh, wouldn't have made it. I wonder if he took any leaks on the ark. Took any leaks. Okay. But that's an excellent point, though. Right. You know, despite the ill-timed, <laughs> non-funny, humorous comment there. <laughs> All right. Well, let's look now. The gospel, which the, the gospel which these people are advocating in the sinner's prayer, 
and the salvation steps referenced within the prayer overlooks Jesus' command regarding baptism in the course of salvation. I mean, so much so to the point that when they look at Mark 16, 16, read it again. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who is, but he who does not believe will be condemned. I've heard some say, well, that's not what Jesus meant. Hmm. And that's the only answer they have. Some will say, thanks to the NIV, well, Jesus really didn't say that. People added it later. Okay. And that's the wrong conclusion as well, I believe. But they say that's not what Jesus meant. That really what Jesus meant is you just need to believe so that you don't be condemned. No, that's an incomplete gospel. On the day of Pentecost, you have Peter and the apostles. They told over 3,000 people to repent of their sins and be baptized for their mission of sins. This promise of forgiveness of sins, as well as fellowship that they would subsequently have with the Holy Spirit, was for everybody who turned to the Lord. Um, and, and we see that in verse 21 of Acts 2 where they, they quote the reference to Joel, where he says, And it shall come to pass, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And surely enough, and, and we won't reread um, 38 through 39, but as Peter told them to repent and be baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of sins, and they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which I believe would be the promise of salvation given through the Holy Spirit uh, found within the Word of God. Some people view it a little bit differently, but, you know. Uh, well, I was always fascinated with that Mark 16, 16 there and, and the arguments that, that seem to be made there. Because it's always funny to me that they, they always focused on that last part, like you say. They're just kind of hone in on that, but he who does not believe will, will be condemned. But it doesn't say who, who, he who does not believe and is baptized and is not baptized. Right. And it's such a strange statement to make because just the most simple bit of common sense tells you that that would be a, a, a mute point of, of repeating that. Because anybody who doesn't believe, obviously, is not going to be baptized. Right. Who, who would actually go out there, well, I don't believe in Jesus Christ, but... I think I need to be baptized for not forgiving my sins. But you could have someone be baptized who don't believe, who doesn't believe because of pressure, right? You know, family ties, right? right things like that. But still, the, the point's the same right. there. Yeah, I heard it. I heard an illustration. Something. Uh, but then they don't believe. That's true, right? And hence the condemnation. Right. Yeah, I heard an illustration a number of years ago. Um, you could say, if you put gasoline in your car and you turn the key, the car will start. But if you don't turn the key, the car won't start. Also, gasoline is not necessary. You know that that's kind of the, the same way they look at that. They focus on you know the singular thing. You don't if you don't turn your key, your car won't start. And based on the way they treat the verse, you would have to say, well, hey, gasoline is not necessary. As long as you turn the key, your car will start. And they always, I think, go back to Acts two thirty eight and twist that phrase. Because, and that's what they use to justify not baptizing. And that's where they think they come back over to this verse and then start playing with the verses there. Because when they look over there, they try to change that word and. Right. Uh, and, and change that phrase to say, because you were saved. Sometimes I look at the Greek word translated as for. Right, for. And like I think yeah. it's ice, something like that, or yeah, E-I-S. Mm -hmm. And there are some times that it can be used as because. Mm -hmm. All right. But in most of the instances, and in this one, most translations acknowledge that it is to be rendered in the fashion of for or unto, not because of. Yeah. And I've, I've always looked at that and just, again, just grammatically speaking, you would have, you would have to change the whole sentence right. to, to actually to, to, come into group, to come into alignment if you were going to change that word for to because. That's right. I mean, you know, repent and be baptized because you were saved. Okay. Um, but it still said repent and be baptized. So, uh, you know, that, doesn't, that still doesn't, that sentence then doesn't make any sense there. Well, the, it, you're right. You know, it's repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, because you've already been saved. Right. So you were forgiven of your sins before you repented, right. would be the way you'd have to look right. at that. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, because of the remi remission of your sins. Yeah. And so, if you say because of, you'd have to change remission. That tense has to change because of your you missed have to sins or something, right? Remitted. That word has yeah. to change. Right. That's a good point. That's a good point there. More things have to change than just that one word, so yeah. I'm saying. And I didn't go about it the right way, but oh, you did a good job. <laughs> yeah. I spoke about it as clearly as I do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that was a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I understood it. You did fine. Um, the sinner's prayer teaches, and think about this for a moment. 
The sinner's prayer teaches that a person can have Jesus abiding in him before being baptized into Christ. Jesus, come into my heart. Now Jesus is in you. Now a week later, go be baptized. Well, let's read Galatians 3, 26 through 27. See how we would reconcile that. Galatians 3, 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay. So he does make the point, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That's right. Mm -hmm. okay. It's not a faith without mm -hmm. obedience, though. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ. They had faith, and then they were baptized. But he says you were baptized into Christ. He didn't say you had faith and were in Christ, then you were baptized. You were baptized mm -hmm. into Christ. You put on Christ. You didn't have faith and then put on Christ and then was baptized. And so the sinner's prayer, that gospel that it's based on is incomplete because it has you being in Christ, being in fellowship with Christ, before the obedience to the command to be baptized. Right. And go along with that, the next point, the sinner's prayer has a person being raised with Jesus through faith before being buried with Jesus in baptism. That's right. And look at Colossians 2, verse 12 and 13. It says, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. All right, look at what he says here in this verse here. It says that you were buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith. When you came up out of the water grave of baptism, you were raised with him because of your belief in him. You weren't raised up before you were baptized. You know, the raising up there is talking about coming up out of the water grave of baptism. And you were raised with him through faith because you were baptized for the reason of your belief. You know, I mean, you, you could go, we, I've used this illustration before in a sermon. You could, be, go, you could go to the lake with somebody. And you and a bunch of people could be swimming in the lake for three or four hours just getting sunburned and everything. And then you come up and around the campfire you're having a little Bible study. And someone with whom you've been studying says, you know what, I'm ready to be baptized. Can you say, great news, you were in the water a while ago, you're good to go. No. It's the purpose you go down in there has got to be because of your belief in order for you to come up being therefore then raised with him through faith and the work of the God. Right. I mean, we see it here in verse 13, the whole purpose of that and, and the relationship with Christ's burial and resurrection mm -hmm. and this burial and resurrection, that is, we were dead. That's right. You know, we, just as Christ was dead. That spiritual death for us. Christ was yeah. physically dead, but he was raised from the dead. And like Christ was raised from the dead, we're going to be raised from the dead. But how do we, where are we raised, like you said, from the dead? Well, we're raised out of the water and grave of baptism. Because of our faith. Our faith. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, 1 Peter 3.21. This is one of the biggest challenges people have. And again, there have been many interpretations offered as a result of this. But Peter says there is an all, there's also an antitype which now saves us baptism. I think I'm reading this from the New King James. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right? In other words, baptism does save us. Why? Because God said so. Because we believed and we were obeyed. And he used the example of Noah in verse 20 there. They built the ark, they got into the ark, the water floated the ark, and therein eight souls were saved by water. In the like manner, we are saved when we're baptized because we appeal to God for a good conscience. Any thoughts? Right. Uh, Paul mentioned here, he says, I noticed that many people want to rep, uh, want every reference to baptism to refer to the Holy Spirit baptism. Right. Um, rather than water baptism, there are many problems with this, and he says maybe another another lesson for that one. Okay, you know, actually Paul brings up the point, I mentioned that there are different interpretations on this. Some people say this is Holy Spirit baptism and not water baptism. And so I think that's what Paul, uh, Paul is saying there. And some will use that to explain the way, or attempt to explain the way Acts 2.38. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, repent and be baptized in the Holy Spirit baptism. Okay. And um, some, some will look at that. And there was, I should have bought this book a number of years ago, I was in a used bookstore. And there was a book, you know, a small one like this, and it set about to prove that the reason why people had to be baptized in water is that it was only in the water that you could receive the Holy Spirit. And his contention was when you went into the water at that moment, you received the Holy Spirit. You know, and, and, and that's why baptism was necessary. But it sounds a lot like Pentecostals. 
Pentecostal belief teaches that you've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and only in His name. But they believe that, that, that baptism is necessary. But a sign of your true salvation is that you are baptized with the Holy Spirit and have various signs to prove that. So that and that may, he may have been a maybe a Pentecostal who wrote that book. I think about it. So well, it looks like we've reached the end of our time. Any other thoughts in the chat room you want to bring in real quick? Yeah, I uh, mentioned there in James two verse seventeen, faith without works is dead. And verse nineteen says um, the demons. <laughs> Ooh, it took me a second. The demons believe and tremble. Uh, yeah, I thought that was an abbreviation for <laughs> yeah. yeah. The Democrats? What? No, I think denominations. Denominations, yeah. <laughs> um, but demons, yeah. You know, and so he says, so are they saved? You know, they believe and tremble. Obviously, they're not saved. That's exactly right. And and James um, Allen there reminds us of a good point. You can tell people, and you can hold, you can contend the fact that the Bible does use the phrase faith only. And in taking James 2, 24, we know that we are not saved by faith only. You know, so it, it's in the Bible. <laughs> just not the context that they would like. And understand, we're not trying to make light of this. It is a very serious matter when we talk about salvation. And we have many people out there who go around with the idea that they heard some preacher on some television show tell them at 4 o'clock in the morning they need to ask Jesus to come into their heart. And they maybe a week earlier they made a horrible decision in their life and they're as low as they've ever been. And this looks like a real quick stopgap measure. So they, they pray the, the prayer the guy tells them to. I keep pointing at a TV that you obviously cannot see. Um, they, they, they say this prayer the guy told, tells them to and then they put their head down on their pillow thinking, thank God I'm saved. Reality or not. And that's, that's the danger of it. And so we've got, and, and what is so sad is that the truth on salvation is so simple. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that repents and is baptized shall be, receive the remission of your sins. It is so simple to understand, but yet because of the teachings of Calvin and Augustine and many others, people have a, a mental block against the necessity of baptism. And so they re explain in their own interpretation all passages that would directly teach the need to believe and be baptized. Now, now, I cannot talk tonight, as Alan said, feel, feel good religion. It is, it, and, and, and that's the thing about the sinner's prayer. It is something that the evangelicals began to use, especially when the TVs, everything, were, were, you know, where they couldn't go to the person's home. You know, you know, the tent meetings was different, but when it got to where they were talking to people remotely, the sinner's prayer came in handy, the quick way of saving somebody. And, and, and those that, that, that uh, profess that obviously knew that it was going to be pretty popular. That's right. I mean, it, yeah. it was obvious that so many people out there in the world who were not Christians and not desiring to follow God would look for an easy way. That's right. There, there's the easy way right there. That's all i got to do. That's a good point. Um, one thing before we close, we're not done with the study yet, and if, if you have heard something tonight about the subject that you disagree with, we'd love to hear from you. Next week, we're going to be looking at passages offered in defense of the sinner's prayer. And so, if, if you believe the sinner's prayer is a valid form of salvation, don't hesitate to write to us. Send your, your comments and your questions to questions at scripturalway.org. And let us know what you think. Give us book, chapter, and verses. We won't make light of it. We will consider it honestly. And we, we would like to hear your understanding of it as well. Um, if you've studied this with other people and you have heard various um, uh, defenses given that maybe we're not going to include, let us know that as well. Send those to us, um, write them down and bring them to the study with you next week and we'll make sure to look at that. And then after we look at the defenses, we're going to look at the case in point of the man from Ethiopia and ask the simple question, did he say the sinner's prayer? We'll look at that and see what it has to say. Any other thoughts or comments? No. Appreciate the uh, comments in the chat room tonight. Abs everybody's participation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Appreciate you being here with us. Um, be watching. I mentioned a couple weeks ago, Paul Adams and Tom Thornhill and I have something in the works. And, and hopefully here in about a month we'll be able to let you know about it, if not sooner. Right, Paul? Um, I'll, I'll give you a note a little bit later about our first test run with that. So. Thank you very much. And hopefully you can join us Friday night at 7 o'clock at Seminole Point dot org 
and you, there will be a banner on the front page there, and you can click to go view the worship services live. And then after that, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we'll be back here again next Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. at scripturalway.org. Have a wonderful week.